Um, his name is Michael and he is a blind uh, certified professional in web accessibility. He is uh, uh, certified through the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, in short IAAP. And he is joining us today from Louisiana in the US. And yeah, uh, Michael, do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that you covered it pretty well. Uh, I can go back to sleep now. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, no, um, so I am, um, as Leslie said, uh, a blind accessibility professional, um, a web accessibility engineer um, for Prime Access Consulting, uh, which is an entity which works with uh, all sorts of different folks from uh, education to governments to uh, both large and small for-profit entities and non-profit entities uh, all around the world. And uh, I've been blind for 20 years and working with an accessibility for 11. So. Great, thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be able to give this platform to you today to uh, talk about your topic. Um, if you like, you can start right away. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, jump right on in then. Um, <laughs> so when we think about um, accessibility, we really have to look at both a large picture view as well as a micro view. What I mean by that is we have to think first and foremost, what is accessibility? Uh, some folks think about standards and regulations, so things like the EU directive, uh, the UK disability law, uh, various laws in other EU countries, Canada's uh, accessibility law uh, in Ontario, uh, or the Americans with Disabilities Act. Some folks think about the web content accessibility guidelines. But when we are taking a step back, what does those laws and standards really mean? Uh, well, first and foremost, they mean that people with disabilities uh, have equitable access to society. Uh, I think the Convention on Rights for Persons with Disabilities frames it very well in terms of this being a human right, a civil right. Uh, when we talk about the digital world, really what we're thinking about is what we're building perceivable. That is, can folks, if they do not have one or more senses, still interact with our content? Is it operable? If a person is not relying on mouse-based or pointer-based affordances, can they still interact with our interfaces? Is it understandable? If somebody is reading it, can they interpret what is written within our user interface? Is our copy clean and concise? And last but not least, is it robust? Is the technology that we're utilizing such that it is future-proof? As we develop further web technologies, can assistive technologies integrate with it? Uh, now that seems a little bit daunting, uh, particularly if you go and read the web content accessibility guidelines. Uh, they're a little dense, uh, very much lit written from a legal perspective, uh, mixing in lots of technical terms. Uh, most folks aren't like me. I'm a little bit uh, dry and boring, and I like to read specifications. Uh, I think I read somewhere that if you take all of the documentation around the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines uh, and put it all into one document, it's somewhere around 400 or 800 pages, somewhere in between there. That's a lot of reading. But really, looking at it from a more micro level, what it really comes down to is our users. Uh, do our users have the ability to interact with our products? If our users 
had the ability to interact with our content, would they encounter any barriers that is present? Can they zoom our content? Can a screen reader interact with it? Uh, those are interesting questions and it comes back down to the user-centeredness of our approach. When we build things, we don't necessarily build them because uh, we want to all the time or because we think it's a great idea. But most of the time, we build things because one, we want to sell it to somebody, and two, we want somebody else to experience the experience. So examining the user, what are what are our expectations for our users? Do we think that our users need some special assistance or do we approach it as if every user has the right to engage? I think that that really is an underlying question that we all have to examine within ourselves. In a lot of cases, uh, when we look at user engagement, our cultures tell us that disabled folks need special assistance or need to be taken care of or need to have some sort of engagement uh, that is different. The reality is that in the 21st century, our users are equally capable of participation so long as they have opportunity to be able to do so. So when we're thinking about the way that our disabled users are engaging, uh, we can use the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines developed by the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, W3C, as sort of the guiding post. Uh, it is organized by those four categories, as I mentioned earlier. But really what we're looking at is, is the technology we're using, our HTML, our CSS, our JavaScript, our YREA markup, our frameworks. Uh, God forbid we're using frameworks, but if we are, which a lot of us do, um, are they communicating with assistive technology? Do they utilize semantics uh, as they are communicating with our technology? Uh, is it possible for assistive technology, such as screen readers, or magnification software or voice control technology to be able to engage. And that leads me into the other part of my talk. A lot of people think that uh, us blind folks uh, might not be able to fully participate uh, or maybe we need a sighted person to help take care of us or to uh, read uh, things for us. I remember one time uh, I went down to the grocery store and I walked in and had my list of things that I needed to purchase so that way I could cook for myself. And the first thing somebody asked was, how did you get here? Why are you here? Can I take care of you? Uh, I remember thinking, well, I, I walked here. Uh, I used my cane. And if you want to help me uh, get my items off the shelf, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Another really good example of the expectations that folks have for us disabled folks can be seen in a really good example of when a friend of mine who has a PhD in philosophy, he's blind, was traveling to the UK. He arrived at Heathrow Airport and was walking through with his sighted father. And he was just about 20 meters or so in front of his father, about to reach an escalator. And as he reached that escalator, security started yelling, stop, 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 sir, grab your blind person, grab your blind person. Uh, don't let your blind person go down the escalator. As if the blind person was property. Now, Blind people have developed alternative techniques to be able to engage with the world. And I mention our physical engagement with the world because of the fact that it has a lot of parallels to the digital world. Uh, 
when we're walking down a street, for example, we listen to where our traffic is. We feel the sun beating down on us. And from there, we can determine where in the sky is the sun. Is it to my right? Well, if it's to my right and it is nine o'clock in the morning, then I know that the sun is to my east and therefore I must be walking north. We listen to the tactile cues from our canes, feeling the vibrations. And from all of those environmental cues, we develop a cognitive map. Now I mention all of that because of the way that we engage with the digital world. When we are engaging with the digital world, we lean on assistive technology like screen readers. Uh, some of those may include JAWS for Windows, uh, NVDA, VoiceOver for the Mac. What this technology does is it communicates with an accessibility API uh, and the browser, uh, taking the document object model and recreating a view that the screen reader can interact with called the accessibility tree. Basically, all of our uh, names, roles, and states and properties for every element is conveyed to the user. Now, this is true so long as we have semantically available information. From there, we look at the various elements and construct a cognitive map. So for example, if I have a landmark, uh, which is an HTML5 element, uh, meaning the header, the footer, a navigation region, or main content, less than main greater, then I have a good idea of how the page is built. Although I cannot see the page, I know that the main content of the page ought to be contained within that main element. Another thing that we use a lot are headings, H1 through H6. Headings, it's really important that they are nested sequentially. So if you have a main heading on the page, typically referring to the title element of the page, then each subsequent section ought to be at H2. And if you have subsections of those sections, those should be at H3. What that does is it allows me to quickly understand how content is related to one another on the page. With my screen reader, I can look at just the heading structure and develop further that cognitive map. Other elements are important too, though, as we interact with the page. I can look at just the links out of context. So the link text we use is important. I can look at the buttons. Again, the button text or the accessible name of the button is super important. The way that all of those are arranged around one another allows me to build that cognitive map. So whether I visit a page for the first time or the 100th time, I know exactly where I'm looking to be able to complete the tasks that I want to, to complete. It's not just blind folks, though, who have developed alternative techniques. People with mobility disabilities who may not necessarily be able to use the mouse but rely on the keyboard can tab through the page, interacting with all interactive content. That's why it's important not just to use divs and spans, but also to use semantic elements like anchor tags, buttons, checkboxes, etc. Voice control technology. If you can't use a keyboard or a mouse, there exists technology like Dragon Naturally Speaking where you can still engage with the content that's present. That's why it's important to have visible labels. Don't use placeholder text because as you type, that placeholder text goes away and it oftentimes doesn't match what the label actually is. Voice control technology users will see that placeholder text assuming that it's got to be the label. And when they tell their technology, click on, whatever the placeholder text is, and it does nothing, they can be frustrated. Cognitively disabled users are also affected though. If they can't refer back to what's in that placeholder, they may not be able to engage. And so the bottom line is that as we are building our technologies, what we have to do is really think about our users. It's not about an imperative for us as developers and designers 
It's not about what we think looks cool. What it is about is making sure that whatever we're building that is really awesome is getting to our users and they're able to experience it in the same way as anybody else and do so with the enjoyment that we want our users to experience. Always maintain high expectations for your engagement, for your users, because your users can do it. We just have to erase the barriers that are present. I want to leave you with a quote uh, from a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Andrew Hayward. He's based out of the UK. He's a lead accessibility engineer at Twitter. And recently he said in a conference talk, the web at its core is accessible. Barriers do not exist until we design, develop, and deploy them. It is us who have failed. And in reality, although I don't necessarily think we've failed, we have a long ways to go to ensure digital equity. The first step though, as Lissy has said, is really focusing on the awareness aspect because we don't know what we don't know and we can't be proactive in redressing accessibility issues unless we know that somebody out there is having an issue. Okay, I'm ready for questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you a lot, Michael. Um, especially, um, I know you've mentioned this quite to me before, and I think it's really powerful, but also something that you said uh, when we were communicating with each other, and you said, as long as, long as one of us uh, does not have access, none of us can. And I think that is also um, a really powerful sentence to, to, make this, um, to make this relevant for everybody and not just focus on uh, a few users that we can reach, but really think about how we can make everything accessible for everybody and really include everybody in this world. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that that point is a really good one. And it's one that I make often. You know, we have a lot of social strife uh, in the world right now. Um, for me, I'm, I'm a big proponent of peace and pacifism and working together and collaboratively mm. uh, and loving one another. And I think that when we think about the various discrimination, uh, whether it's active or passive, uh, intentional or unintentional, uh, we really have to look around and say, you know, as a community, what do we want? Um, mm. And the fact is, like you said, you know, if one of us doesn't have access, none of us truly have access because mm. it's a world where we all communicate and share knowledge. And at a point in which we are not allowing somebody to participate in that knowledge production, yeah. then we're not getting the full knowledge that society deserves. Yeah, that's true. And especially coming from the, from the sort of like knowledge <laughs> angle, um, everybody has something to add to this society. So why should we be excluding people just because we built products that might not be accessible to those? Hmm. Yep. Um, sorry. Did you want to add something? Oh, no, I was just agreeing 100%. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>